Leveling Up Housing and Community Select Committee report into funding for Leveling Up and our own briefing a couple of weeks ago, which set a proposal for a more streamlined and more strategic system and what that might um, look like. It's difficult to disentangle and um, it's a complicated um, system, but we're primarily today, I think, trying to focus on how central government disperses its money to local government, rather than, I, I would say, an even bigger question, which is how actually local government is funded um, in its entirety, although they're obviously related uh, questions, but to try and make it manageable in 59 minutes or less is try to think about how central government goes about doing what it um, currently does. And we've got a fantastic panel to explore um, these uh, issues. We've got Clyde Betts, who's MP for Sheffield South East and uh, chair of the Leveling Up Housing and Communities uh, Committee. We've got Councillor Abby Brown, former leader of Stoke-on-Trent Council and chair of the LJ's Improvement and Innovation Board. And we've got Councillor Pete Marland, who's leader of Milton Keynes City Council. We've got loads to cover, cover but I want to try and do it in two parts to make it uh, manageable. Part one, we're going to look at the problems and the degree to which there is a consensus around the problems in terms of get our panelists' thoughts on that. And then part two, uh, we'll explore what needs to change. So I think if we agree that it does need to change, it'll be interesting to see whether there's consensus from the panel on what needs to change and in what uh, way. Before we start, we've got a poll, um, a question to, for the audience. If we can have that question up, you'll get about 15 seconds to say yes or no. It's pretty simple. Uh, and then we'll get the results and then we'll pile in and hear from uh, from Clyde. So would streamlining funding grants help local authorities to deliver leveling up? I can only imagine what the answer is going to uh, be. But nevertheless, uh, let's see what the answer is. 93% overwhelmingly say uh, yes, so we're off to a good start, good consensus. So uh, let's see what if our panelists agree or, or disagree. I think it'll be in the detail that we might start to see some divergence. But Clive, you kick us off. Um, you know, you pu published a, a report in May looking at leveling up funding and all, all of that. It's fair to say that you weren't overly impressed. So just give us a sense as to the pricey of the, the problem as the committee understood it. And then I'll get Abby and Pete to come in from a reception uh, perspective. Clive. Uh, okay, Andrew, and I think you, you probably ought to ask the 7% now, Andrew, to come and explain to us what the system is, since they think it's, it's perfectly okay. Anyway, um, yes, we, we did a report, cross-party select committee. Yeah, we, we were pretty critical. Um, I think we saw the system as extremely complicated. It is short-term. You know, the, the just one example, uh, the EU regional funds used to be allocated on a seven year basis. The Shared Prosperity Fund, which is a replacement, is a two year basis. And um, the local government saying very clearly that some of the projects they want to enter into uh, are longer than two years. So you can't fund them properly, if at all. Um, it's complicated because of the bidding process. Uh, you know, almost unanimous evidence given to us that uh, that that isn't effective. Uh, it doesn't mean the money necessarily goes in the right place. It goes where a civil servant thinks it ought to go, which isn't a great way uh, to fund local activity. Uh, it, it, it's, it, it means that authorities spend an awful lot of money, often in uh, wasted funds. And the other thing is, I think most important, that the, the various funds are not joined up. Uh, there's no evidence that the bids that are successful relate to other bids that are successful from another pot of money, often from a different government department, because that's the thing. Local government gets its funding from so many different streams of money from different government departments. Uh, that's a major challenge. And I think, to be fair, the Secretary of State and the Minister accepted to us that they hadn't really got an oversight of what happened across government. They couldn't tell us how much money was in the various pots of funding for local government to bid for uh, in the various government departments. They simply haven't got the information, which is quite astounding, really. So uh, th that, that's, that's a major problem. Uh, just looking at uh, what happened, and we drew the alternative with Germany, uh, they had a problem of levelling up, if you like, when East Germany uh, uh, joined West Germany on, on unification. Uh, and they basically committed themselves to a 30-year programme uh, with, with massive central government resources, federal government resources in their, their, uh, in their situation, uh, and a commitment to devolve resources over a long period of time uh, to, 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 to their local government. 
uh, our system is far too short term. It's far too disparate. It relies on what Andy Street, the Conservative mayor uh, of the West Midlands, has called the begging bowl culture. And I think we can all agree uh, that's not a, a good way forward. Um, and, and another acknowledgement as well, that if you think back to Eric Pickles when he was Secretary of State, and I didn't agree with everything that Eric did as Secretary of State, you might not be surprised to hear. But one thing he did do was to abolish ring fences uh, for the most part. He didn't like them and it was a mission to remove them. Unfortunately, begging polls, if you like, or pots of money to bid for, are simply another example of ring fencing writ large. Because uh, if you get the money for one particular project, you can't spend it on something else, which that something else may actually be something that's more relevant to a local community. But in the end, local councils bid for what they can get. They bid according to the criteria that central governments laid down, not according to the priorities of their area. And I think that's a major flaw with the whole system at present. Brilliant. Thanks, uh, Clive. Just, just before, I'll come into Abby and get yeah. reflections on that. Just come back to you for a second, Clive. I mean, when you were interrogating um, the Secretary of State and the ministers, to, I mean, I, I read the transcripts in a sense that you're right, that they didn't really uh, have a grip on where the money was coming from, what it was going to. I mean, how did they respond to that? Did, were they overly concerned about that? Did they worry very much about that? I mean, what, what was the kind um, of response? Well, Secretary of State often is quite open about his concerns, to be fair to him. And he did say, yes, he thought there were far too many pots of money. Uh, it needed to be consolidated. There need to be a simpler system. There needs to be more devolution. He, he accepted all that. So, so yes, we have got... Uh, you know, the, the proposals now to simplify the system. All I would say is that this may be a proposal to simplify it, but it is not a proposal to create a simple system. Yeah. It is still very complicated. There are lots of checks in it, lots of monitoring from the centre, lots of uh, requirements on local councils to tick the right boxes. Uh, this doesn't look like much like devolution to me. It looks like a, a change from the current over complications to a slightly different form, maybe less complications, but still very complicated and very centralised. Brilliant. OK. Abby, um, give us your, I mean, since you've been on the, you know, you, you're on the receiving end of these systems, having to bid into them and, and all the uncertainty, et cetera, that Clive's just set up. So just a little bit about your reflections on that. But actually, you know, what does it do then in a place like Stoke in, in your ability to think about how you plan for change and how you think about the money coming in how does it how does it affect how you behave and what the decisions that you make so i think that it kind of drives two behaviors in a way doesn't it um one which clive touched on there which is you bid for what's on offer and you know you bid sometimes for things that, that you don't want um i think what's interesting particularly in the um in the center for cities report is kind of the focus on the per proliferation of the funds and that's everything from your big stuff so you know leveling up and you know the parameters around what you bid for for leveling up funded quite broad right the way down to for example this week's announcement is those councils who've won money to remove chewing gum um, and another one you know i think was particularly notable changing places for um, disabled facility toilets you know so we're going from government saying bid for big stuff right the way down to you can bid for one of these little specific things and i think that's really interesting as an insight i think what it did for me um, was actually drive a strategy where I reflected on what we wanted versus what we could bid for, and perhaps reflection of the sort of person I am, that sometimes that overlaps, so, you know, clearly Stoke on Trent under my leadership, very successful um, at things like levelling up funds, but what it also did was drive me to want to lobby to influence some of that specificity along with my MPs. Uh, perhaps a good example for that would be, um, and I'm going to give him credit for this now, and let's hope nobody else was behind it, reviving your railway scheme, reverse beaching. Um, my MP, Jack Breaton, loves trains. Um, he's always loved trains. I've known him for a number of years. He's lobbied hard on trains. Probably not a surprise, therefore, that Stoke on Trent did quite well on reversing the railway scheme because it's something my MP and I particularly lobbied on. We made it a centre point of one of our four priorities. But firstly, not everybody's going to behave the way that we did. Um, uh, you know, not every leader is going to want to be the way that I was, where I wanted to go out and do those sorts of things. And actually, too, why should you have to be? <laughs> I think, you know, the point that Clive made that, again, the report points to, which is it's about knowing your place, about being trusted to know your place, isn't it? And, and responding accordingly, as opposed to the government saying to you, I think, Abby Brown, you should bid for a change in place in Stoke-on-Trent. Well, you know, maybe I should do. But actually, is it right for the government to tell me that that's what I should be bidding for? Or should that be down to me and my democratic mandate? 
Yeah, no, that is a very good, very good point. We'll come back to that as well. And your point about, you know, the distortive nature about you end up bidding for what is on offer rather than what you actually uh, need, I think, you know, is, is a is a classic problem when when the system operates in the way it does. Um, Pete, let's get a reflection from uh, from you, obviously, thinking about how you how the system influences what you do, but then just kind of broader reflections on the system and its problems. And then we'll move on to thinking about what the um, what we might do about it. Yes, yeah, so, I mean, there's very little I can add to what Clive said, really. As chair of the LGA Resources Board, it is something that the LGA, with Abby and, and our colleagues on, on a cross-party basis, have advocated, is that the levelling up pots are not a particularly uh, good way of delivering the government objectives. But I think I'll come back to that <clears throat> sort of at the end of what I've got to say. I mean, bidding bidding isn't new. And, and, and I do think we should get away from this idea that, you know, this actually it was the last government or the last government, but one I, I lose count. Um, it was more, it was the Boris Johnson government that sort of put in place the sort of, smaller pots of bidding money but let, let's not sort of pretend that this isn't a problem that stretches back a long way you know one of the first things i did as a local council when i was first elected in 2012 was open a new railway station in my ward that was paid for by grant um growth area funding which was a biddable pot uh, from from the john prescott era so it is not sort of a new thing that is just sort of this government has come up with it there is a, a finite pot of money and there will always be, I think, an element that all councils, regardless of their income and regardless of where they sit on the levelling up spectrum, will want some of that money. So I know Stoke. Stoke is one of the most deprived places in the country that needs, needs a lot more levelling up over the whole town than Milton Keynes does. But that doesn't mean that Milton Keynes, which is one of the more affluent cities in the UK doesn't need some levelling up itself in areas like Bletchley. We've, we've got quite a quite a, a disparity in um, in income. We've got quite a disparity in life expectancy in some of our places. So all councils will want some way of accessing money. Whether bidding is the right or wrong way to go about that, I think actually what has come about over the past few years is those pots have got smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. So with the grant area funding, I think it was thirty million pounds for a new, for a new, um, for a new train station. Then when LEPs were bidding, it was sort of hundreds of millions for infrastructure funding for HIF bids. And now we're talking tens of millions, if not sort of in the low, in the low single single digits of millions for leveling up. And I and I think that that's it's all about opportunity, cost, and risk. If you're bidding for 250 million or 100 million pounds as a council, you can afford to put a member of staff on it. You can afford to sort of bring in some staff. You can afford to bring in consultants because the the opportunity cost of winning that money obviously is vast compared to not winning the money. But if we're talking about 10 million pounds or 5 million pounds, sort of it always comes back to me in the offices is, well, why aren't we borrowing this money? If it's so important, why aren't we doing it ourselves? Because we can afford maybe 250, 500,000 pounds a year for the next 20 years, borrowing from the Public Loans Works Board. So it, to me, it's not the bidding process necessarily. It's the clarity of the bidding process is rules to make sure we're all in with an even chance and that somebody doesn't come in sort of from the outside rail and win at the last minute, even though, you know, it, it maybe it would be the prime minister's constituency or something like that, you know, that wins money when it's absolutely not necessary. Um, over over the, the size of funding. I think the second thing, and particularly from the LGA point of view, is the short termism of it. Because if if you don't know this part of money is coming and it's announced in a budget and you're expected to get a bid in, in six weeks, as Abby said, I think you come along and you go, actually, I'll, we're, we're thinking of doing that anyway. So we'll do that. We're thinking of doing that anyway. So we'll bid for that because strangely, after the past 13 years of austerity, councils don't have 200 million pounds worth of investment projects just sitting on the shelf ready to go in case a passing barge of money comes along so it does drive short-term behaviors and it doesn't drive long-term outcomes and that's where i would say that perhaps there are two issues here that are overlapped one it's 
what outcomes do the government want? Because £15 million is nice, but putting a park bench in a town or getting rid of some chewing gum or putting a few planters out or doing up a bandstand is yeah. not going to change somebody's life who is born born into poverty, who needs a long-term plan to go through school, to get the skills that they need, to make sure that the city or town has the jobs that are required, that's not going to happen with 10 million quid. We might be able to do up a building. We might be, able, And so some of this ultimately comes out to what are the objectives of levelling up and what are the priorities of levelling up? Um, and that then wraps about right around to that very first thing I was saying about those smaller pots of money don't necessarily lead to the outcomes that the government want, but maybe maybe they have been driven more from a political angle because 500 million sounds a lot when announcing in the budget. Divide 500 million by 300 councils, it's not so much. Not very much. Yeah, exactly. That's a great point. Thank you, Pete. Um, lots to pick up on that. Clive, come back in on this. Lots said, but let's, let's just think about the, the, the bidding process as well. You were kind of critical of it. Pete offered a, a, an additional nuance in it, which was, you know, there's a bidding process, but it's also compounded by a lack of transparency as to what it is that you're bidding into and the extent to which you're going to win or not. I mean, what's your sort of take on, on that? You know, are you critical of bidding full stop or bidding with a lack of transparency and, and clarity? Do you have your thoughts on that? And get Abby to come in. But as I said, we said that there may be occasions when you're starting off a completely new initiative that you might um, look at bidding at, at, at the beginning of that. Uh, but as a general rule, I think we didn't think it was a great way to go forward. Um, it, it's uh, and, and the, the, you know, the other criticism we made, I think, was of the criteria, the lack of clarity over that and transparency. Um, you know, if, if, you, if you're trying to deal with deprivation, why not use the index of multiple deprivation as the, as the starting point? And it wasn't. Uh, and there was, of course, the the real problems around the second round of the levelling up bids, where the government changed the goalpost, uh, sorry, spent a lot of money uh, putting bids together. And then at the last minute, the government announced that if you got a, a successful bid in round one, you couldn't get anything from round two. Well, you know, and then later on in the budget, the Chancellor announced that one or two areas that had been successful in round one, now we're going to get some money. Uh, I mean, th that's not a, a very helpful way to run anything. No, no. Yeah. yeah. Have you come in on that? I mean, you were successful in round one, but then presumably that prevented you from from uh, bidding into round two, which is not helpful either. But just your your reflections on this, you know, on the bidding issue, bidding per se, bidding with lack of transparency, lack of clarity. What's your, what's your view on that? I guess I'd probably still say that at this moment in time, I'm a bit in the honeymoon period of saying, you know, incredibly successful in terms of bidding. However, if I reflect back a bit further, you know, the wider parameters of this, I think the transparency element is really important. One of the things I remember particularly um, when I, I first um, went onto the cabinet in Stoke-on-Trent was actually the massive perception problem that we had as a place. Um, and I know you don't overturn that straight away where, when you go through change of control or, or just even change of leaders, but, what I do reflect on is that over eight years of working incredibly hard to change perception, that probably only came to fruition in the last couple of years. Now, you know, perhaps that's a, a comment on Stoke on Trent generally and political leadership there, or actually maybe it's a reflection on how hard you have to work as a local authority leader to convince often civil servants that you're okay, that, um, you know, the number of conversations that I must have had in the first four years where, so, sorry, Peter, I like Peter a lot, and we get on really well, you know, they were convinced that we were a Labour authority. But this is pretty basic stuff, isn't it? And I'm not saying that I should have been biased because I was a Conservative, but they didn't actually know anything about us. They didn't know anything about our vision or what we had in place. And it isn't about the politics. It's about then the fact that nobody knows my place as well as I do. And why can't I be trusted to make a decision on what's important for us rather than somebody else telling me? And when you put that into the into the bigger picture, you know how hard that makes it and how unlevel the playing field is, that there are so many other moving parts around how successful you are, as opposed to, frankly, how good your bid is. And, and really, you know, when we're talking about whether we should be bidding or not, you know, it's no wonder, is it, that I, you know, I heard of places during levelling up where leaders just didn't bid at all. And, you know, I kind of don't blame them. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, that is a very good point. I should have said at the beginning, if you those on the call uh, on the webinar, if you've got questions or comments that you want to put in, uh, use the Q and A function, and I'll um, I'll wheel them in or feel them into the to the panel as best as I possibly can as we as we go along. Um, Pete, we'll get we'll get onto part two, which is what what should we do about these issues? But I just wanted to to come back to you, Pete, get your Reflections on it again, Clive and Abby come in afterwards. You, know, you mentioned like the cost of engaging in, in the process, which we hear a lot, and you know, the LGA have done some work on, on looking at some of those those costs. Can you just say a little bit more around that? You know, kind of how how well, A, what numbers should we be thinking about? But then how does it distort what you as a council and uh you know where you allocate resources to to whether you're doing this stuff or, or not? I mean. It's like any KPI, isn't it? A KPI always drives a certain behaviour, whether your bonus depends on it or whether whether it is a is a key out, outcome of your company if, if you work in the private sector or whether you're in a council. So so I would say what the bidding process did, does, for instance, is it, it puts pressure on me and, and no doubt um, Abby until recently as a leader to bid because, you know, you've got opposition politicians, you've got all sorts of people saying, if you don't bid, obviously you don't care about this area. Um, and so it drives odd behaviours because in one sense, I, I would like to stand aside and say, actually, you know, this round of funding is sometimes, this round of funding is not for us. Actually, I would prefer smaller, uh, I would prefer the same pot of money to go to a small amount of councils because if Stoke-on-Trent or the Wirral or, you know, places of deprivation improve, we all get more tax and ultimately, you know, there is more money to bid for in the future. But that doesn't mean that I don't want some part of money to come to Milton Keynes at some point. But then when you bid, you know, you have to engage consultants, you have to you have to sort of speak to civil servants, you have to understand what the bidding criteria is. And as Clive said, that's not always, and it has been very clear, it's not always been defined very well. Um, it, it, they're not, it's not defined very well in terms of what success will look like in terms of the bidding process it's not defined very well in terms of what success will look like at the end of the project and what and what's changed um it's not like someone's sitting around measuring measuring me but it, it costs councils i think on average i think i think the lga i think the lga figures were i think it was about 300 300 400 thousand pounds per bid which is not a small amount of money and that doesn't obviously include a lot of on cost and and in gratuity that you get particularly i think um we often think of these sorts of bids as just councils working working away in their in in their little in their little offices sort of not doing very much but often these bids involve quite important partners that sort of it involves quite important third sector partners who are charities that can't really afford to put a lot of time or effort into these sorts of bids, but it also it also involves businesses. So, for instance, Santander are um, a, a major employer in Milton Keynes, and one of our bids was for um, I think you you know the project, Andrew, the MKU project, because you sat on our commission for 2050, um, and Santander are a major corporate sponsor of that, and sort of for the government to then turn around and say sort of no, that project isn't going ahead. It yeah. often plays badly on those corporates as well. And they think twice about next time getting involved, committing committing, committing their staff and time and resource and also their reputations because they don't want to be told, these are businesses, they don't want to be told they've failed in anything. And so th those, th those third sector organisations and our partners, it takes a lot of time and effort to get them lined up and it's often on, on them that the the, the, the 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 smell of failure doesn't doesn't fall very well. Yeah, that's a great point. It's not as you say. It's not just the local authorities. It's all the other partners that are you know are trying to be involved. Clive, what was the sort of evidence that you got from the in the inquiry that you undertook in terms of costs uh, going into trying to bid? And then we've got a good question from from uh, Jenny Llewellyn, which is basically, did you see you know typically those that won or win? tend to have more capacity and more resource to put into the process. So, you know, they are naturally advantaged as a result of that. But Clive, what was the, what was the nature of the, um, of the, of the evidence you got? Well, I think, it, I, I mean, we simply got 
from local government what local government told us and we have to accept that but it was it was so much across the board uh there, there was no difference between authorities of different sizes of different political complexion compla uh, complexions that they, they were saying to us very clearly this is a costly exercise um particularly if you want to do a good bid that you think you're going to win with on a, on a major project with uh yes uh, other partners involved as we just said uh, then uh, the, the cost can be significant uh, and it, it is it, it is wasted money. Uh, it really is. And, and I think also you have to um, recognise that, that councils have had such a reduction in their back office staff because they've been told quite rightly to concentrate on frontline services that many of them have, have a less capacity now to do this work. Uh, they, they have you know, fewer researchers, fewer policy people and... Uh, the other thing I think we can't put any real cost to is the the, the feeling of frustration and demoralisation when when councils make a real effort to do something that they know is important for their area, and at the end nothing happens because the bid's unsuccessful. I, I just think it's a it's a process that we've got to reflect on very carefully about whether it's got any benefits whatsoever. And you know how many pots of money are there? Well, I think we had one count that went to over 300 now in different government departments. Yeah. Uh, and as has been said, some are down to a, a few thousand, others are, are, are multi-million. Uh, but but not, not, we, we had no evidence at all that this was a, there was a real cost benefit uh, in total to authorities working in this way or being asked to work in this way. Yeah, no, that's a very good point. Um, right, let's move to part two, uh, Abby, which is the tougher part, I think which is what do we want to change? So um, give us a thought from you as to give me some headline thoughts on change. I suppose the obvious challenge is if there's a fixed pot of cash, and as Pete said, everywhere is getting something, then everywhere is getting not very much unless the pot of cash is enormous. So there's, you know, there's things to be kind of thought out through that in terms of how you, how you allocate criteria used to allocate if you are going to use some form of criteria and then obviously there's some accountability stroke uh you know responsibility questions but um big picture uh abby you know what what needs to change what would you what would you do so unsurprisingly i you know i think the recommendations from the report are, are fairly spot on pete's already sort of indicated in a way that amongst ourselves as a local government family we recognize that some places need more investment than others and actually Whilst there may be small p politics around that broadly, I, you know, I don't think there is, but there is lots of money that is um, around. I'm sure Pete would always like more, as would I have done when I was leader, but there is a baseline of things, aren't there, whether it's UK SPF, um, you know, whatever happens to things like growth deals moving forward, levelling up, you know, there is kind of that broad consensus of some cash there. But I think that, you know, one of the things that I particularly like, perhaps because it's the sort of thing that I did, is this broader idea of a plan for your place. And we know that that has an element of traction with government because we see particular places where that has played out, whether it, whether it was Manchester, um, you know, in the last 10, 15 years around that, or whether to a degree, I would say the sort of thing that I was doing in, in Stoke was playing out. I think, again, though, the, the challenges, you know, the one that I highlighted earlier around getting the government into a space to understand that and have respect for you to do it within whatever parameters it is, because actually it shouldn't really make any difference um, that I'm a Conservative, um, that Pete's Labour, if you've got a good plan for your place, if you if government can see that, then you should be recognised for that and supported to do it. Now, I appreciate that that then puts an onus on government to put some effort into, into reading plans and things like that. Um, but equally, it puts an onus on us. You know, I, I, I can't think exactly what it was, but during the COVID pandemic, we were given an opportunity to design something ourselves. And the immediate thing that I saw was everybody asking what exactly that would look like. And I think there is a need, therefore, for leadership within local government to say, actually, this is what I'm going to do. I think across the board, actually, we're pretty good at that as a sector. But we need the, the opportunity to develop those plans, to be encouraged to do so. Whether you know, I think the closest I saw in recent years are things like the local industrial strategy, where it is a lot broader in terms of what you do, as opposed to things like, I'm showing my age here, the LSP from years ago, you know, where it was pretty prescriptive, wasn't it really? And the plans are going to look the same. Yeah. But I think that opportunity to kind of think yourself about what's best for your place. And again, you know, as Pete says, talking about revenue and people, not just shiny buildings. 
as well. And, you know, I think that's a challenge that we all have as politicians that, you know, I remember this whenever I was standing in front of a big regeneration project, the call would be out, well, why don't you care about young people, older people, homeless people, vulnerable people? Well, I do, but I'm afraid it's not sexy, is it really? You know, which is why I drove at a plan that really was, was as much about people as it was um, about place. So I guess I would say, um, you know, that idea of government, I wouldn't say necessarily a strategy, but giving us that opportunity to create something that shapes your place. Yeah. I think that is really where, where local government's, you know, speciality is. We know our places better than everyone else and there's some brilliant big thinkers out there. Yeah. Leading and having, councils. And having the, sorry, having the plan, as it were, for your place, that is like, um, I don't know, sort of a threshold that's a, a quality kite mark in the sense that, you, you would expect and require, you know, from a central government's point of view, you would you would have to expect local authorities to have a plan and for that to be tested in some way in order for it, you know, to so do we know it's not just a wing and a prayer, there's a bit of robustness to it. Is that is that the way you were thinking on that? Yeah, I, I think so. I think there's a danger though, isn't there? And in, in if you add too much robustness, it becomes the same for everyone everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's an identity kit plan, isn't it? But I do think that opportunity to influence what's important for your place. And, you know, there will be some similarities, but there will equally be, be differences. You know, I would say that Stoke needs something across across everything in a way. But Pete might say he needs something in a different space. And that's absolutely OK, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, no, quite. Um, come to Clive in a minute. Pete, give us your, you know, big picture sort of need for change obviously abby's talking about uh, plan and some kind of through that an allocated uh, mechanism where's your where's your thinking at well i mean as i'm not speaking on behalf of the lga and i'm speaking on behalf of myself i think um you know me i might say something slightly controversial which is i've always thought that leveling up is a is a slogan in 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 look at, in basically in search of some ideas and and i think that has to change I think that whoever the next government is after the next election really needs to focus down on what that means. Um, and once you've got the idea of what it means, and then you can judge it, then you can judge it in terms of whether it's been successful or not in, in the things that they're funding. But if you do really, do, I just get the sense at the moment that sort of like there were some places that the current government did not really expect to win in December 2019. And sort of it, 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 it sort of it tried to backfill some of that space with, quite rightly, because because that's what politics is all about, to, to support those communities that the Conservative Party had never won before. And perhaps maybe where those people have felt let down by generations of Labour leading them in local government, you know, and, and, and so that's absolutely fine. Uh, so I think whoever wins, there needs to be a very clear outcome, whether it's levelling up, whether it's whether it's about whether it's sort of like this this old phrase that the Labour Party used to use called equality or equity or whatever you, whatever you want to call it. I think just in terms of bidding, like I say, I think it depends on the scale. But I also what we haven't touched on is just the sheer breadth of what councils are expected to bid for at the moment. On one hand, right up the top scale, we're expected uh, effectively at the moment to find a few friends knock on a minister's door and say we've got a devolution we've got a devolution sort of settlement that we want you to grant to us and that's a competitive process right down the line to sort of here's 500 here's 500 quid for some for some um, for some uh, anti antisocial behavior officers or something like that i think was another fund that came out a couple of weeks ago you know just that sheer scale is is enormous and we can't bid go possibly think about bidding for everything bidding i think would be fine if it was a smaller amount of things for more money yeah um, and that, that's absolutely fine and then and then finally i would just sort of say well you touched on it earlier there is no short-term fix to this it has to be a long-term project and where abby is right where you sat on our commission for 2050 those proper plans for places i thought I think there was 40 odd industrial strategies sort of half a decade ago. I don't know where they are at the moment. You know, I think 47 of them said that they all wanted to be 
places that employ jobs for the future, tech, AI, all that sort of thing. You know, very few places. And again, I'll be controversial, Andrew. Very few places ever shit, say they want to be really shit employers and have really <laughs> low-paying jobs and sort of go back to the 1880s. No one ever says that about their local place, strangely enough. Um, so you end up with a bit of herd mentality. So I know you're very keen and Centre for Cities are very keen on combined authorities and Metro MERS, and they have their place. But I think when you're talking about levelling up, the best people, and the, just touching on your uh, suggestion that it should be the highest tier of government, which should be the point person for some of this, I think most people will tell you, if you're in Burnley, Lancashire County Council has six or seven places that need levelling up. You know, Stoke is best to tell and understand the... The, the needs of Stoke. Milton Keynes is the best to understand the needs of Milton Keynes. I would not put this particular agenda in the hands of combined authorities unless they've got a very particular sort of subset of how they're going to deal with individual places as well. Yeah. Because I think one of the big issues around particularly the Greater Manchester Metro Mayor, is that it is very heavily focused on Manchester. And Manchester still has huge pockets of de uh, deprivation, but I would say, what about Rochdale? What about Oldham? What about Bolton? Um, and they, I would say that they haven't really seen a lot of benefit from the metro system at the moment. Okay, very good. Okay, that is fair. Good, good repost to some of our uh, some of our suggestions. Uh, always, thank you for that, Pete. Clive, come in on on this. I suppose. Go on, Clive. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. There's an awful lot of points there, isn't there? And uh, that's without getting on to the whole problem that's just briefly been touched on about local government revenue funding, which is a whole other area that needs some form of resolution if we're going to sort these problems out. What we called for as a committee was a devolution framework so we can get some idea of what, what's going to be devolved to what various parts of the local government structure. And I think we challenged uh, uh, Neil Brown when he came with what he said was a very radical su uh, suggestion, uh, and that's essentially things should be decided at local level, and this is a, unless there is a very good reason to decide them at national level. Turn the whole system on its head. I think it's called subsidiarity, uh, which we used to be in favour of when we were in the EU and wanted things done at the national level. Well, I think we ought to transfer that down uh, to a local government level. Uh, in terms of which level, uh, I started off being very sceptical of the mayoral combined authorities. I think I've become uh, more supportive and convinced by them. Uh, I think uh, on a, an economic basis, they can uh, do things that perhaps individual authorities couldn't always do. Uh, and I think that doesn't mean to say that they're going to uh, make all the decisions in an area. But, but if, if they are genuinely about a number of authorities coming together to work constructively together as part of an MCA, then I think they, they can work. And talking to Greg Clark, who's given evidence to the committee in the past, he would say that, that he wouldn't have got nothing off the ground as a Secretary of State with the Treasury unless he'd gone and said, this is a new arrangement. I'm going to test it in one or two areas to see if it works and prove it can work because the Treasury wasn't going to go for a big bang across the whole of the country. And I think they are still a bit in that frame of mind. But then the problem, of course, is that you've created systems in Manchester and a follow on then in other parts of the country. But many parts of the country haven't got an MCA. So how, how do you put down to local, more local level in those areas where an MCA isn't there to do that wider uh, economic look? So I think that's a challenge that we, we probably haven't got an easy solution to at present. I actually agree with that, Abby. Again, it is about local authorities knowing their own place, being the best to make decisions there. I think the local industrial strategy was, was a good solution, which should have been developed and wasn't. It was abandoned. Um, I think we had so many changes of government policy. That's one of the other problems, isn't it? I referred to Germany. Uh, they had a consistent policy for 30 years to deal with the disparities when the East joined. We get a new initiative every other year in this country. Uh, and that, that lack of consistency uh, means that things simply aren't done. And the big question, I think, at the end of the day, and, and I'm not you know, a problem with levelling up as a concept at all, but what does government really mean by uh, addressing it? Uh, is it that they're going to provide lots and more money to help the poorer parts of the country uh, you know, get up to the uh, same level as others, uh, particularly in terms of productivity and high value jobs and research and all those important issues? 
Or does it mean they're going to have the same pot of money nationally and they're going to spend more of it in the more deprived areas? But then the government says, well, actually, we're not in favour of levelling down. Now, they can't have it both ways. Either there's going to be lots more money to spend on levelling up in total, or there's going to be the same amount of money and more of that same amount has got to be spent in the more deprived areas because we've got the most unequal country now in Western Europe in terms of the disparities between whole regions, not necessarily within regions, but in terms of disparities between regions. Yeah. And if we're going to address that, we need a long-term plan, need lots of money, and need a willingness to trust uh, local authorities to deliver most of that. Yeah, that's a great point about um, about government at least having a sort of strategic purpose and objective for what I'm being very clear about what it is trying to achieve, which will invariably mean making some choices and some decisions between doing A or B. You know, ideally everybody wants you to do A and B, but if you know if if you have to make some choices and choices need to be made and they need to be communicated. Um, clearly and need to be consistent. Clive, I'll come back to you in a, come back to you now and get Abby to Pete come in. So both Pete and Abby talked about having, you know, some kind of plan that, you know, releases the money, as it were, Clive, whatever that money is. Do you see that as part of the, the release mechanism? And do you see that as one of the kind of accountability questions? I mean, you know, from a I'm not central government, obviously. In set, from a central government point of view, should they be worried about accountability on the money that is being spent? How do they keep an eye on it? You know, that's part of the argument for the bidding and competitive process. I don't buy it fully, but that's part of the argument that they put well, forward. Well, I, I think if government's claiming responsible responsibility and accountability, and I think we have to look at one or two things around PPE contracts, don't we, in the, um, in, in, in the COVID era and yeah. lockdown. So, you know, central, uh, central government's uh, uh, handling of new technology and new computer systems isn't always, uh, you know, d- d- merit a great deal of uh, you know, A-stars going in to, uh, to, 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 to rate it. So, yeah, I, 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 there's no evidence at all that local government can't manage better, can't uh, do things right. Of course, yeah, th- th- there'll always be the picking out, won't there, of some authorities that have got things badly wrong recently, uh, and there isn't any excuse for some of what's happened in some authorities. But overall, I think local government can say very loudly back to the centre, we've had the biggest cuts in the last 13 years of any other part of the public sector. And across party, across councils, we have managed that very well and responsibly. Uh, And I think we can be trusted to manage more money better in the future if you devolve that money uh, and devolve that responsibility down to us. Yeah, no, that's... That is a fair point. Abby, coming on, on on this, you know, on this on the question, particularly, you know, around the accountability mechanism. I mean, uh, Clyde makes great points about central government not being a stellar performer in that sense. But how how would you find a balance? Would we need to find a balance between allocating money and then keeping an eye on what that money is spent for, even even if it's spent as said, but just in terms of whether it's having an impact or not? Well, yeah, I, I think absolutely, and I think. It would be a pretty poor reflection of the leadership in that place if they didn't want to do that themselves. You know, I think Pete made the point earlier in terms of impact. And I think, you know, as, as a local authority leader, you want to demonstrate that you've had impact, that your plan is working, or, or even actually if it isn't working, that you're honest and transparent about that and what you've learned. So I think absolutely, you know, I, I think that's um, that's a given. I think, you know, the, the wider question in terms of um, how you get to that sort of point and, and you know, and as Clive mentioned, the challenges elsewhere is, is one we need to reflect on, isn't it, around that. I, I'm still minded um, to say that we've had a few big, high-profile challenges, but the vast majority of local authorities are delivering fantastic services to all of their residents every day with, that, with minimal issues whatsoever. Unfortunately, there's one or two that have had issues, and it doesn't matter actually what we do. Um, to a degree, you can't ever rule that out because the electorate will vote how the electorate wish to. There is no mechanism in place that says that they can't elect, uh, you know, have a, have a complete turnabout, chuck out all the current politicians, elect a whole new bunch of people who've not got a clue what they're doing, who basically say to their officers, don't really care what you say, this is what we want to do, and they go ahead and do it. There's no system that's going to ever stop that. Luckily, it's only ever going to be a very small risk, isn't it? But that will always be there. And ultimately, you know, that, that's a system that we have. It's, it's local democracy, isn't it? 
Yeah, no, quite. Um, Pete, come in on that, but also um, pick up another issue which you've all touched on uh, in slightly different ways uh, around the sort of term horizon for funding. You know, as, as Clive was saying, you were saying currently it tends to be around that one to th three year is now regarded as fairly long, longish term. Uh, Clive talked about, you know, the German example where it's 30 plus uh, years. I mean, it, what, what would you see in terms of the, that sort of time horizons, and maybe there's milestones along the way, but you know, what, what would you ideally want this a new sort of system to be operating on a five yearly cycle or a ten yearly cycle or or what what, what would be ideal from from your perspective, Pete? Well, I I, I think I mean, there's no barrier to long term funding settlements in this country. I think I got an email pop into my inbox yesterday from British Canals and Waterways saying that their funding settlement for 20, the period 2027 to 2030 uh, to 2027 to 2037 has been announced by the government and over the course of that 10 years it's going to be 300 million pounds less or something it's like if british waterways can have a settlement until 2037 i think i would like one um, <laughs> it, you know it, 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 it it's bonkers how we can uh, our government and it because it sits in this British waterways can sit in this plane of it's a trust, it's non-political, it's it's sort of we know the canal is going to be there in 15 years and therefore we can fund it, but we're not going to give local government the same funding horizons. Well, you know, I've got news for the government, whether it's me sitting in this chair or whether it's the leader of the opposition or whether it's Abby or, or her political opposition, there's still going to be a stoke on train council. There's still going to be a, a Milton Keynes Council, and so those long there's nothing stopping those long-term funding horizon, horizons. And we do it in other areas. We do it in defence. We do it in all sorts of areas. And often, what the barrier to taking away that funding is often how far you've got down the line of really achieving something. And I come back to that. If the government said it wanted to end or, or reduce child poverty by 30, 40, 50 percent. You know, there would be a cost attached to that. And if they said they wanted to do it by 2050 in the same way we want to we want to be carbon neutral by 2050, that's a long term aim that requires long term investment. I couldn't see a government coming in in 2000 and 2000. When would the next election be after 2024, 2029 and saying, actually, I don't want to reduce child poverty by by 40 percent. We want to do so. We want to do something else. You know, where you set those lines often can become aspirational for future generations. And, and, and I think governments can do that and should do that in, I think, in the same way that Germany did, because it was a real national challenge to turn around East yeah. Germany. Yeah. Um, and the government have done it. And where I would give them a little bit of credit, not for the cause, of it, but certainly for treating the symptoms, is that sort of three or four years ago, they wanted. They said they wanted to end street homelessness. They didn't have a bidding pot for that. There are certain things you can bid for, but local authorities are generally given an allocation at a, at a proportion to the level of homelessness in their area. Yeah. And it has yeah. a huge effect on homelessness. You can never end homelessness because of the amount of people on the streets with, you know, complex particularly medical and uh, mental health issues, but they've gone a long way to doing it. Yeah. And it costs money, but they gave money on the proportion of the task in hand. Yeah. And that would be the same for child poverty. That would be the same for number of people that have been out of work for over two years, et yeah. cetera, et cetera. Okay. And that would seem a, a much better way of doing it. Okay, very good. Clive, come, come in on, on this, the sort of, time horizons, time terms that you you talked about longer term. I mean, you know, single regeneration budget back in the day extended out to maybe seven years, if I remember rightly. New Deal for Communities was, you know, crudely a 10-year program. So even, you know, it's not 30 years, but there's a bit of precedent for more than two. You talked about some of the European funding stuff being sort of seven years. What yeah. kind of time horizons would you think would be minimum or uh, a wide deal? I think the... the yeah, a, a local government funding itself, that the revenue funding could easily be done on a, on a four to five year basis. And there will be different cycles for different sorts of uh, money, different sorts of, uh, of 
uh, projects and objectives. So that's on a, on a regular ongoing basis, which seems to be give the certainty that, that councils need simply to get on with their day-to-day -day business. <clears throat> when you come on to other issues like uh, you know, net zero, and we shouldn't always present this in terms of it's either local or national, I think you're going to have there a national strategy which councils are going to deliver for the most part. Um, I'm old enough to think back to the, um, you know, the, the clean air policy um, uh, dealing with uh, smog and pollution uh, in the 1960s. The central government scheme which councils delivered at local level and did it brilliantly and it worked. So I think you're going to get more of that. So but the central government's got to say over the next 10 years, this is our policy. Th these are our financial uh, arrangements. Councils get on with it. You've got the certainty now uh, to get involved. I think the same is true of um, it, 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 one of the real problems in this country is the massive disparity in productivity between different parts of the country. If you go to the uh, basically the, 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 the north of England from the you know the, the, the north Midlands upwards, indeed some of the, uh, the southern Midlands as well, um, productivity is now lower than the Czech Republic overall. It's staggering. Uh, the, the gaps uh, between the, 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 the northern and the southeast and the rest of the country are now as big as they were in Germany on reunification. So you do need a, a national objective there uh, uh, to deal with uh, research, to deal with developing catapults and clusters uh, and, and how to involve local government in those. So it's a national policy. There's going to be some national decision making, certainly. But then you need to link that in uh, to economic development at a local level. I think that's the challenge, not to see all this as, as an either or. Either it's all central government or all local government. It's what is central government's overall objectives? What's the na nation's priorities? And then how can local government be involved in shaping those at a local level and, and really delivering most of those projects because they know their area is so much better? Yeah, very good. That's a very good point. Um, what, what, one more sort of just thought from three of you, and um, we'll begin to wind up. But maybe, Abby, you kick us off. Um, you know, one of the other ideas. We, we would suggest in it, others have suggested it, not least um, uh, Michael Hestlein and others, is to essentially consolidate the 200 plus, 300 plus pot, you know, individual pots into one one big pot or, or you know, a few smaller, big, big, big pots. Would you be would you be in favour of that? Is that one of the ways to think about, you know, consolidation of the funding streams as a kind of major step forward, as well as then how we allocate it and the purpose we attach to them. But would you be in favour of that? Yes, I think absolutely. And obviously, hand in hand with that would go um, a widening of the parameters around it. I think, you know, some of the specificity is ridiculous, isn't it? You know, I had a bit of a, a you know, ongoing battle around why Stoke on Trent couldn't bid for um, the town's deal. You know, um, Stoke on Trent is a city made up of towns, so I might have wanted to narrate it as being a city, but nonetheless it has towns and we couldn't bid for that as a result. And you just, but then you look at other examples and you think they get around it. So of course, amalgamating them and therefore widening the parameters to mean it actually is more about, is more driven about broader strategies, presumably aligned, you know, I think productivity is a, a really good one that Clive outlines, that actually to move you away from the geographic specificity that we have seen or the type of authority or, you know, north, south, you know, urban, rural, all that sort of thing. But, you know, I, I think just very quickly to pick up on Clive's books, I think it's very well made. I had four priorities that I drove as leader, improved transport, economic development, um, education skills and health and productivity. Now, I would say that there's always more to do on all of those four for us as a place, but the one that I found the hardest to get anywhere with was health and productivity. Uh -huh. um, just couldn't get anywhere with it. I was chairing the health and wellbeing board. Um, you know, we've got challenges with children's services, so very much into the space around some of those issues. Crikey, I, I did couch to 5K and ran two half marathons, and I still couldn't get the government to be interested it's something like a massive issue for us as a place and that I, you know, kind of almost become evangelical about in terms of, you know, my, my leadership around it. But I think it's, is it almost too big a problem, too far forward? And, you know, again, the point made around how do you have that consistent vision? Because there is no difference, I can tell you now, well, I hope not in between my view and Pete's view on some of these issues. There yeah. is there is no politics, is there, in ensuring yeah. that children live um a healthy life that they're able to get a good education there is no politics in that how do we get to that place where these are accepted norms that we all champion and there is no politics in very good pete um would you you know as part of your sort of plan for moving forward would you, would you be in favor of 
you know, seriously fewer, therefore much bigger uh, pots of cash or, you know, allocate, and then that they're allocated, you know, on slightly different objectives, notwithstanding, you know, Andy's point, but they probably need to be broader. Would, would that be one of the things you'd be in favour of? Um, I think Clive put his finger on it earlier. We, we had that. It was called the European Structural Fund. Um, and it, it was it was a very big pot of money that was channeled to very clear areas where these massive structural issues needed addressing. Now, if you're saying rather than calling it a regeneration pot, because I think, as Abby said earlier, I think regeneration conjures up this idea that particularly around the Pathfinder stuff in the Northwest sort of 20 years ago, we'll sandblast a few houses, we'll, we'll put a solar panel on, we'll, 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 do, a bit of, we'll do a bit of insulation, and, and, and that's fine. Um, but I think what we are talking about, and hopefully what we've got to, is there is a place for that. There is a place for place regeneration. There's a place for improving estates. There is a place for working with our health services on smoking cessation on the Lakes Estate in Milton Keynes. But I think what we're talking about is big struck. You, yeah. you, you very quickly go from what will change the lives of an estate to what is a national priority. And I think where I absolutely agree with Clive is some of these things are national priorities. And we, we will only shift the dial, not one or two degrees, but sort of over here, if we take this as a national crisis that requires that level of funding and that level of structural funding over a, a, a period of cycles. And yeah. again, I, I thought this is how government worked. Yeah. You know, local government shouldn't be saying we need a three-year funding settlement because that's the minimum we should require. Yeah. We have we have spending review periods which should be setting local government budgets, but we've got out of the habit as a country and perhaps the government of having proper chunky spending review periods. And most governments will come into office sort of saying we will honour the previous government spending review. There's no reason why those spending review periods can't be seven years that outlast governments. And if a new government wants to come in and perhaps add to that, that would be absolutely fine. But yes, I think that long-term structural funding needs to be in place so we can tackle the difference be between the productivity in Middlesbrough and the productivity in Milton Keynes. Because, you know, you literally, the point of your organisation is you produce all this data. And I think Milton Keynes is now the 11th biggest, 11th or 12th biggest economy in the country. Yeah. Um, the economies that are above us now are combined authorities or city regions. Yeah. Um, yet there are cities that are double the size of Milton Keynes with half our economic output. And we have to address the reasons why yeah. and get to the heart of that. And that won't be done with 15 million quid. Yeah. The final, right. thing, final thing I'll say is this won't happen unless councils or combined authorities have the capacity to do it as well and it's not just about having the money on a plate we've got to have the officers because i think clive pointed out that we've stripped away all that capacity and now we are down to the bare bones of when we have a housing estate we plan for the infrastructure of the housing estate and it's knock on impact yeah. 15 years ago we'd have had a whole plethora of sort of infrastructure projects ready to go that were required and that we understood that funding was coming for. That's yeah. all been stripped away and needs rebuilding as well. Yeah. Oh, that's a very good point. Very good point. Clive, final thought from, from you, I guess slightly different, but I mean, re reflect on what you said, but more particularly, I suppose, you know, overwhelming consensus, not just, uh, you know, in a panel of three, but all the inquiries, the inquiries that you've done and a, a recognition, I think, from, the government of the day that the system is increasingly not uh, fit for purpose. You know, when you look forward, I mean, what, 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 how will change come about, Clive? Can you, it's a tough question, but I mean, if everybody agrees that the system is no longer working, even if we would ideally want it to, I mean, how do you see the change coming about that, that there is pretty universal consensus for? Oh, if you have a, a government that is actually brave and being prepared to take radical decisions, that might always not go completely according to plan. Yeah. And that, 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 that's one of the, the concerns. I mean, you come into uh, finance of any kind, local government finance, you suddenly do things differently and it doesn't quite work. Uh, one authority, you know, out of all the many authorities, uh, misspend some money 
uh, and all the headlines go in the wrong direction. Are you prepared to take those risks? Yeah. Because yeah. unless you have a government that's prepared to take risks to alter the current failing system, it won't change. Yeah, no, that's a very good, a very, very good point. Uh, a fantastic hour. Uh, brilliant panel, uh, Clive, Abby, and Pete. Thank you very much for your uh, for your considered views, both on the problem, but also on um, on how we might uh, change. So, a huge thanks uh, to you. Thanks to everybody for coming and for posting your comments and your questions. Um, until the next time, take care and stay safe. Thanks again, panel.